uh, to start off with, a lot of people here, I, I assume, grew up on Boy Meets World, yes? Yeah. Uh, parents in the audience raised their kids on Girl Meets World a few years ago. Yeah. I, I'm curious about what the four of you grew up on, like, what were you huge fans of, the way that people are gigantic fans of this room of Boy Meets World? What was your, your go-to? What, what was it that you loved when you were a kid? I, I, I have to keep killing time while Ben does his panorama. <laughs> I can answer for Will, because I know that, but no, uh, I actually didn't, I grew up without television, so, um, uh, books, books is an acceptable answer. Oh, okay, then let me think about it for a second. Uh, I was a huge, um, television fan, like a huge television fan, so, uh, MASH, Cheers, all the um, and then 80s cartoons are the greatest thing ever, so, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Thunder, Mask, Mask, yeah, all Mask, yeah, all that kind of Matt, everyone's like, Matt, yeah. So those are like Lion the greatest o. things ever. Thank you. Lion o. Yes, yeah. The greatest things ever, so yeah. Uh, I watched, as a kid, kid, I really only watched Sesame Street, and I was obsessed with, with what I called Bot and Oni, and I carried around a Bot and Oni. <laughs> Bot and Oni. <laughs> That's what I wanted to I just thought it was Bert and Ernie. I was like, what is Bot and Oni? <laughs> The Wonder Years! She has a son coming. He's going to be named Bud and Nani. Bud Nani Ben, do you have an answer? My name. What's the question? What were you a fan of growing up? What were you really oh. super into? Oh, I, I just want to go back to the boat and Oni. My nephew's my like, I want to watch Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, two. So now, <laughs> he wants to start with the second one? Yeah. Really? Guardians of the Galaxy, Uncle B. Guardians. Watch the cartoon, it's better cartoon. <laughs> what did we watch growing up? Uh, uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse. Uh, Goonies, the movie. Yeah. And of course, I don't have a third. Of <laughs> oh, Adventures in Babysitting. Yeah. Great movie, yeah, great movie. Uh, since, since, since we're allowed to not just you know, move beyond television, uh, Stand By Me, I was obsessed with. By the time we started watching Boy Meets World, and I, I was interviewed about this in like one of these Teen Beat magazines, and I embarrassingly admitted I had seen that, I had seen that movie at that point, what, like 47 times or something? <laughs> and it kind of makes sense, actually, when you, when you think about Sean on Boy Meets World, he was like clearly like a Stand By Me-inspired character in the midst of this comedy. <laughs> kind of makes sense. But unfortunately, he was, um, like the sad kid from Stand By. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even like you know, like the happy kid. It was like the sad cry. The drama, the drama. Stole the milk coat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kid that you were just expecting. Something terrible is about to happen to him again. All the time. Right. Exactly. Chris Chambers is the character name. That's right. Yes. I, yes. Chambers, as I say, yes. That's right. So I have a uh, I have a bathroom in my house where you literally you can just write on the walls. You write all different movie quotes. And right when you walk in, I see Ryder's handwriting. It just says, best candy of all time? Pez. Cherry flavored Pez. No question. It's like there's a stand by me quote right there. Right? We'll just, we just, just talk like this the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, you're, you're good. We're fine. I would like to say, if we're talking about movies, I watched Runaway Bride on the way here. <laughs> Which what is that? Uh, Julie, Julie Roberts cannot come in. <laughs> Wait, didn't she like run away from like nine different weddings? She did. Or did. Then don't marry that lady. I, I was thinking like there's a bunch of comedy. She keeps running out of people spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on wedding. And the wedding dress. No, oh, she has to put it on. Yeah, that can't be comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> she, she waits until the second she's about to say uh, her vows, then runs. Yeah. The Maybe effort. the problem's you. Maybe. <laughs> it's, it's your fault, Julia. The, the ninth, the ninth one. Yeah, exactly. This is what we're going to talk about for the whole panel. <laughs> Anyone want to jump in here with a movie? I'm, I'm going to throw one more at you, and then, and then we're going to turn it okay. over to the audience. Uh, the, the four of you uh, grew up at different stages of your life, relatively speaking, making the show. Uh, and something that I've heard you all talk about in interviews is the kind of atmosphere that Michael Jacobs created on this show that made it not the typical, you know, child acting experience atmosphere and, and way to be 
on a set as a kid and so on. What what was it that he did that made the show itself, uh, you know, not just work but a comfortable, safe place? Um, it, it, yeah, it didn't hit any of us. <laughs> um, I think what Michael did and what all the directors did and our student teachers and the writers is treat us like adults from day one and, and respect us as actors, um, which, you know, a lot of times isn't the case on sets, unfortunately. It's like, uh, oh, you're a kid and you're kind of like treated like an animal, you know, like, just don't startle the kids. Uh, and put peanut butter on his mouth. Yeah, okay, yeah, smile. <laughs> I mean, literally, there, there, are, there are stories of um, very, very successful ch child actors who were fed cookies for saying lines correctly. Um, okay. There's so, one that I knew, I'm not yes. going to say any names, that there were rattles involved, where it was literally they were trying to get this person to pay attention, and they had like a rattle, and they go, and the kid would look up, and they, yeah. 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 I'm not going to say any names, but I, we know people whose uh, set chairs were handcuffed together, because they always wanted to know where they were. <laughs> I don't know. No, the kids. They're director's chairs. They were going to So we had, we, had a, we had a very loving environment. And <laughs> what, what, only a few shackles. Only if some, yeah. No, what, um, what Michael, it, it, what singled Michael out as, a, as opposed to a lot of other writing, writers or executive producers is uh, his note sessions. We would do a run through. Um, so, you know, they're rewriting the, the script. We shoot in five days. Um, or we'd rehearse for four days, and on the fifth day they bring in an audience and we do it. But in the process, we're doing a run through for all the writers, and they give us notes and then rewrite the script. Usually, note sessions are about 15 minutes. We're like, oh, you missed this joke here, try restaging that. Michael's could last up to two hours. Um, and he would sit with us and go line by line through the script, and in that process, teach us a lot about acting and comedy. And his references, none of us would ever get because he would be like, you know, in the 1947 edition of Black, and like, Jesus, you know. But we learned a lot, um, and it was always respectful, and it was always teaching us about, you know, our craft. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was a great environment. I remember one thing that he used to do fairly often. I think he did it with all of us, but he certainly did it with me. And it might sound like it's in a way kind of mean or cruel, but it was one of the best lessons that I ever had. Is he would come down and he'd say, "Just remember that this is going to end." Like it was, because it's one of those things, you're on a television show and it's popular and you think you're so cool and he would always keep us down to earth by being like, yeah, we're having a great time and someday this is going to be over. So you have to remember that this is going to be over and by the time it's done, I mean, I was the oldest person on the show with all of us. I was 23 when the show ended. So it's like, what do you do now? Um, so that was one thing he did that was, I think, very important and helpful was like, just remember, this is all going to end someday, so don't think that you're the greatest person in the world, you got to go on and have the rest of your life. And that was really important, actually. Yeah, to writer's point where he's talking about treating us like adults, like, you know, we can talk about how we felt safe and it was comfortable and all those things, but he was also, Michael was, Michael was demanding. He had, he had an idea in mind, he knew what he wanted, he wasn't going to settle for anything less than that. He didn't really like to watch the show from behind the monitor side, which is where most executives watch. He likes to stand and watch them like in between where the cameras are. And so he'd be filming something and he would have just given us a note and in the middle of the take he'd just go, no! and, 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 and he'd all stop and then he'd stop in the middle and he'd walk right out and he'd give us the note and tell us to do it again until we did it the way that he wanted. Um, he and <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, like Ryder said, the note sessions, um, now we've all, you know, we've moved on into different phases of our career and doing different things. And I've been fortunate enough to direct a lot now. And I know, I, I can very single-handedly point to the fact that I know how to break down a script and find beats in a script because of Michael's note sessions that I wouldn't normally have known because he explained all of that. This is what I was thinking when I wrote this. This is why this happens. Do you know why that happens? This is why this happens. And you would, we would find layers and things that otherwise wouldn't jump out off the page without him explaining it. So yeah. that was very helpful. On a totally different note, I spilled a whole lot of tea on myself on the way here. It's <laughs> my undershirt. And as you'll see, I, I looks like I took two with the chest here. <laughs> so I'm going to give this to whoever has the best question today. <laughs> Gross. It is, it is my passion for tea, so it's got Will's passion. <laughs> and somebody's going to get this, so you. make sure. Your questions are good. It's quickly changing to really terrible questions. <laughs> Nobody wants to win. Uh, <laughs> great one, but now. So there you go. There's some incentive today. Uh, I've, uh, 
<laughs> you can't play Ben. <laughs> I was going to ask if I could have that autograph. Please. I'll um, get it from Sean Aston for you. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I <clears throat> look back on, on this uh, journey that we all had together, was that, as you can tell, we were always having such a good time on the set. So for me, that was what I always take away from that, was that um, no matter what was going on, like, I just felt like you're kind of with family. And um, every time we were doing a scene, I was just always having the best time. So, you know, your, your work life and your personal life and your social life all kind of blend in. I just remember, I was just, I just always had the best time with them, and I still do. So it's always fun when we're behind the camera together. It's true. Um, we, were, we were talking about something else. I wasn't listening. What? <laughs> I, uh, I just have very fond memories of working with all of you. And, uh, yeah, that does not win my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I was going for the sentimental approach. <laughs> You're almost there, but here, I'll, th I'll throw Ben one more, see if he, can, if he can take it home. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about working with William Daniels. Now, all of you worked with William Daniels, Mr. Feeney, uh, but Ben, you in particular, you know, what, what was, that, that, was, that was a very long relationship that, that you had with him as a colleague, but were you looking up to him as a mentor? Were you having you know conversations with him? I did, and I <clears throat> I know Danielle, Will, and Ryder can all speak to this. But um, for me, it was always he was just um, such a respected uh, actor when he started with the show, and so when Bill would come on set, it was like you really felt like you were the presence of a very accomplished, prestigious actor, mm -hmm. and everyone on the show was talented. The whole cast was great, but. I always relished my scenes with Bill because you felt like you really had to step up your game a lot because he was such a professional on set and he was so um, he was such a perfectionist. But um, you know, I learned a lot from him as an actor, and uh, I really enjoyed my time with him. And um, you know, not a lot of people get to work with someone of that stature, so it was very exciting for me, and I know it was for everybody else. Was Bill a notorious prankster? I mean, what was he like on the set? He was, he was, he was very, um, you know, he, he was the consummate professional. So he would show up day one, memorize the entire episode, even though it was kind of like a waste of energy because they always rewrote your lines. But he would, every morning, he would be there. Would you ever get something time. like, right, that's not your line. Yeah. <laughs> no. That, you know, the, the funny thing about his voice, because I didn't really know who he was, but I, I had seen Knight Rider. And we were, we, were doing, we were doing a note session in our executive producer, Michael, so he was, Michael, and I'm like, I know that voice. <laughs> and then I remember asking him if he was from England. <laughs> we all thought he was he's British. Like, no, it's, it does sound like that, though, doesn't it? I'm like, yeah, it really does. He was super nice. Um, I actually really enjoyed seeing Bill recently. We did a convention with him. Um, at, you know, he's 93 now. 92. 92. And uh, his wife, Bonnie, uh, is amazing. She's also an incredibly successful actress. Uh, they were on St. Elsewhere together. They worked together a couple times. And she was on our show a couple times. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's been really nice to get to know them as a couple, because Bill is very like private, and when he's at work, he's at work, and she's the exact opposite. She is like just a talkative, very actory, emotional. And telling us things about Bill that makes Bill go like, Bonnie. Yeah. <laughs> so we're getting a real skinny now it's when we great. hang out with them, and it's, it's awesome. awesome. Yeah. It's like, oh my god, all those years we just thought he was so like buttoned up and professional, but yeah. we're getting the true story it's now. Great. It's great. Um, Will, do you want to talk about working with Bill? Because you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Bill and I Bill and I worked together a lot because I think we were so the characters were so different that I, I had to go to Michael and say I want to do a scene with Bill and we did a scene where then Eric was dating um, Mr. Feeney's niece and that was kind of the first time I got to work with Bill and they went oh there's something about this that kind of works and they, they stuck us together a lot um, and so he and I had a, had a, a have, have a very special relationship I, I that was the thing it was also kind of the same thing with Michael Jacobs is Bill never treated us as kids we were not children, we were just other actors he was working with. I don't care that you're 11, I don't, this is your job. Um, and he was never cruel, but uh, he could be a stern taskmaster at times because he was he was a child actor. So um, he, he knew what he expected of himself and he expected that of everyone he worked with. He didn't matter what your age was, you have a job and this is what you're here to do. So uh, we had a very interesting set in that way and I think nothing prepared us to go out into the world, especially the entertainment industry, like being on that set. With, those actors and directors and producers and writers and teachers and 
Uh, yeah, it was great. You hear a lot of horror stories about, we always joked that um, the real true Hollywood story of Boy Meets World would have been really boring. Because uh, we weren't drug addicts, we weren't clubbing, we weren't, it was, we were actors doing a job, enjoying ourselves, and being on a show we loved. Danielle, did working with Bill influence the way that you have worked as a director? Ooh, good question. Um, you know, I think maybe maybe in the way that I that I um, like like Will said, he could be a stern taskmaster at times. We always felt a little bit like we could be totally ourselves and goof around and have a great time when Bill wasn't in the scene, and then when Bill was in the scene, we all felt like no, we gotta be serious. Uh, and you know, we didn't want to let him down, and he was such a perfectionist. We he would shake. Um, out of fear that he wasn't going to remember all of his lines. And meanwhile, all of us were like, well, who cares? We just do it again. <laughs> you know, like, whatever, so you forget something. Uh, and so I think now as a director, when I work with, you know, I, I direct a lot of Disney Channel shows, and so I, there's adults on them, and then there's kids on them. And so I, I think it's, a, it's changed the way I see that dynamic and how I, um, I treat I treat, I let the, the freedoms that I will, as a director, allow kids to have in a scene when it's just them by themselves versus when there's another adult actor there. It, it's affected the way I kind of keep them on task. I always just liked hearing getting Bill to say, Michael. 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 Anytime I think you hear him say that. Michael. You guys have seen Knight Rider. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> All right, now, we're, now let's find out who's going to win Will's discarded stained clothing. <laughs> I, I tried my best shot and I didn't get it, so uh, I will decide at the end. Um, I have two questions, but um, who pulled the best prank on set or off set? And make that not be one of y'all, but and what was the prank? And then what was your favorite episode to shoot? And who was your favorite person to work with? I think we all know that for Ben. She said two, and I think we got three questions. <laughs> that, that was a final exam. <laughs> Is this essay, I will be. <laughs> Section A. <laughs> well, I, so uh, maybe to start off with, was it a very pranky set? Were you pulling pranks on each other, or tricking each other, or anything? Um, I know that the, one of the cast members and I used to prank each other all the time. That was Tony Quinn. Uh, Anthony Tyler Quinn, who was the, uh, Mr. Turner. Um, <laughs> he, he and I would prank each other, and I remember one day coming to the set and opening my dressing room door, or trying to, because he had packed furniture and garbage from floor to ceiling and all the way across. Um, full, full, it must have taken hours, it was amazing. I, I like him, but he's a legend to yeah. me now. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty incredible. So that was, that was the best one that I can remember. Cause it would, I would like, I, he was the guy where you'd start something small, like, you know, like, I moved your salad board, and he'd flip your car upside down. <laughs> Oh, that's not the guy to prank. Okay, because he really takes it to that. It's not like the little graduate. Really interesting. Um, as for my favorite episode to shoot, I don't like to speak for everybody, but we always say this because it kind of was our favorite episode to shoot. We just call it the Scream episode. Uh, it was called the Number Um, which was the Halloween episode, which uh, we, we didn't have an audience that week. We, the entire episode, we were just trying to make each other laugh. And uh, some, of the, some of the scenes they used, you can see one of us laughing in the background because we just couldn't get through it. So uh, that, was, that was, I think, our favorite. Yeah. Who was your favorite to work with? Any, like guest stars, any notable guest stars that, that dropped in on the show? Or a main cast member. Or a main cast member. Yeah. Our, our favorite to work with? Yeah. I think we all know who Ben is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems like you know better than he does. <laughs> Mr. Feeney? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. He's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to say it? There's seven I years. I think you have a on Mr. Feeney, honestly. What? I think I've grown to appreciate the fact that I was working with them later in life. Um, and I probably I did at the time. But we always have these random guest stars, like the Love Boat cast. <laughs> Ted, Ted Lange and Bernie Capel were on the show. And it was wonderful to work with them at the time. But I think as we kind of grew, I really appreciated getting a chance to work with them. We did. We had some television. Jerusha and Anne was our grandmother. I mean, there's some, some great people. Sure. Daniel's parents. Yeah, yeah, Daniel's 19 different parents. <laughs> I think six or seven of our little sisters were pretty famous. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. yeah. Next up, go for it.
experience was there's so many different ways to go. Uh, you know, I, 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 for me, I think you just have to, if, if you want to be an actor, you just have to act every, every chance you get. So if that means signing up for a class and getting, you know, doing a weekly acting class, do it. If you can get, a, you know, doing a play somewhere. But I've noticed, especially now that I've gotten, you know, older and have so many friends in the industry, I've noticed that the ones who just keep working and are always willing to, like, you know, I'm, my, my brother and I write direct stuff and we'll have projects and ideas. But we have friends who are very successful actors, but they, they don't always show up, you know? They don't always, like, come and do something. Whereas, like, I have other friends who have a second, I'm like, hey, we need a couple actors for this. They're there in a heartbeat. And those are the people that now we write stuff for, you know, because it, it changes our attitude, their attitude and their willingness to just be, be part of it. Um, so as far as advice, like, if you can get into the mindset of, like, don't think about being a movie star. Just think about being the person who shows up and has a good time and acts, and you will get work. And people will want to be around you, and directors and writers will want to put you in things because they like working with you because you're reliable. So that, that advice right now. Talent is something you can't really control. Do you have it? Do you don't? I mean, you can work on it, but, you know, I don't know if it's something you can really, like, learn how to act. I think you either can do it or you can, or you have an interest or you don't. Um, and, I, and I think you can, you know, hone the skill but it's really about your attitude and your sort of can-do spirit. Uh, as for voiceover, go online and do Steve Bloom's classes or Dee Bradley Baker's classes. So that's the best thing you can do. Dee Bradley really Baker has a great website. Yeah. Uh, I want to be a voice actor. I want actor. to be a voice actor. He answers all your questions. And just remember, voice acting, it, it's no different. You're just being, you're an actor. So you just happen to be using a different instrument, but that's all you're doing is acting. So that's all it's about. I always feel bad when I answer this question because it seems like such a curmudgeonly thing to say, but I'm, one of the best things that ever happened to me was finding what my plan B was that I loved just as much as plan A. So for me, you know, made the decision at 10 years old that I wanted to be an actor, and then at like 27 years old, I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore, but I don't know what else to do. Like, I'm not good at anything else. I've been doing this my whole life. Uh, and I went to college then late life, and I studied psychology, and then I going to get my master's degree in marriage and family therapy when Girl Meets World came around. And once I found that psychology, and I, I loved it just as much as I loved acting, and I knew that if I ever made the decision to not work in entertainment anymore, I knew what else I was going to do that was going to fulfill me just as much. It made working in entertainment so much better because it wasn't a desperation feeling. So my best piece of advice is know what else drives you and gives you passion and you love just as much as your number one passion. You're, you're in the middle of that. Uh, <clears throat> this is wonderful advice. Are you writing this down? Because that's good for me. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know you were supposed to show up when your friends ask you to do something. <laughs> and now I've got a voiceover. tremendous amount of rejection in this industry, as is in any industry. But it was just to add on to what Ryder said, that I think the core of your character, just the ability to keep going, to you know, overcome adversity, um, to rise above negativity, and just, just keep pursuing what you want to do. And I think that's kind of an important philosophy for a lot of things in life, that you just kind of focus on something you want, go for it, and you know, you just rise above the negativity and just keep pursuing what you want, I think you'll be okay. And like Danielle said, if it's not that, you'll find another passion. Thank you for your time.
give us a scene together. So there's one scene in season seven that we have together, and it was a disaster. It was a disaster. It was. We did not have together. Um, but I would have loved to have done that. You know, and, yeah. and that it would have been fun because Will, Will and I are great friends, but we actually never had scenes together. And that was one of the reasons why the, the Scream episode was so fun is because it was one of the few times when, because usually you know sitcom storylines are A and B storyline. It was always the A storyline was either me, Ben. Danielle, and the guest star of the week, and then Will always had the B storyline, so he was always off doing his own thing, and part of that was because they, they had to schedule the schooling. We were still in school, so we had to do three or four hours of school a day, so our schedule was being shifted around, and we never had to work together, so I was I <laughs> well working with Will, uh, so yeah, any storyline would have done that. I, I agree, and I think the funny thing is that you, you, as an actor, too, you kind of always looking at what, it's almost like the grass is always greener. You're always looking at what, like, I always looked at the stuff they were doing, and I was like, they're doing a dramatic story, and they're getting to act, and all this stuff, and even people that come up in the, in the, in the panel, they're like, I want to thank you for, you know, really helping me get through, you know, my parents' tours, or my an absentee dad. Very rarely do you hear people come up and go, hey, I want to thank you for the character of Eric, because it helped me when I sneezed the lottery number. <laughs> um, so, it's, it, you know, it, I always wanted to be on, like, a, a, a more dramatic show, and he wanted to be more wacky. So it was always, that's always the way to do it. It's, it's sort of like you're pitching the coolest road trip buddy comedy. Yeah, yeah like, we're like, just like us. We just need plus. We just need plus. plus. Yeah, yeah we, just, we, we just, we never had, never had it up. <laughs> See, we got just that Danielle. <laughs> 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 that was
mean, when, when you had those special issues that were that were something that came up in various episodes across both shows, uh, how how did you find the, the process of learning more about the very sensitive subject matter that you were covering? How did you handle that responsibility? Well, uh, particularly to your question, I uh, and when I was talking earlier about what, finding a plan B and like knowing what you want to do other than acting, one of the jobs that I did after Boy Meets World ended was I went and worked at a school as a teacher's assistant for special needs one to three year olds. And a lot of them were children that had not necessarily been diagnosed with autism, but were most likely falling somewhere on the spectrum. And I spent a year at that school and it was, amazing and it was incredible and I got to see you know um, how difficult it can be for families to you know to learn to interact with and to overcome and to try and you know fit into normal society and be accepted um, and so that was my personal experience with it. I, I'd also like to add the episode you're talking about specifically is the autism episode is that correct? Correct. They researched these episodes like crazy. I mean, they, there was so much effort done into the research. And what you don't know when you're watching these episodes is that every single word is scrutinized by not just our writing staff and the actors themselves, but by Disney. Um, there's several people there that work. We actually brought on consultants um, for any particular episode that we thought was particularly sensitive. I work for Walt Disney World right now. So I'm sorry? I work for Walt Disney World right now. Okay. So, and I, I, I if I'm correct, I, they, I delivered a bit of a a speech on that, on autism, about it being a spectrum. And I remember that during that speech in particular, there was people from Disney Channel, as well as consultants, making sure that every single word was not just accurate, but also respectful. So we do, we do put a lot of background into it, all the effort. And I do have a second question, but I want to ask you that about that, that actor too, but I want to ask it here. You know what? You're my best hype man. They will be back at their table after this, so follow up. Good, Would you give it to the group? Don, let's hear it for Don, everybody. I have one last question. One last question? Yeah. Yeah. One last question. I can never help being overridden. Yes, one last question. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you again for helping me with my um, pregnancy announcement. I just made a little bit of note. But since I have like a pregnant and everything, I wanted to know a quick question. Um, if you could live off of one food like, forever, <laughs> what would it be? Oh, really? oh we saved God. the difficult questions for last. <laughs> <laughs> One food forever? One food. Can it be two foods? <laughs> <laughs> One food can be two food. One food forever? Can it be two foods? <laughs> You're the guy who's like, you get three wishes. Well, I wish for a thousand more wishes. I'm that guy. I want dinner and dessert, so you only get one. You get one food. Sushi. Sushi. That's it. Hands down. Dinner and dessert. Sushi breakfast. Food? Okay. She said food. Sushi breakfast. Sushi breakfast. So you can go broad then? Oh, yeah. Sushi breakfast. Okay. American food. Thank you guys so much.